in our conversation for today, I thought it might be fun to start to talk on a, on a topic which many people are interested in and many of us have actually lived through. But there's very little that's actually been written or even talked about here. Uh, and it goes something like this, that, that many, many people, of course, have the impression that, that centering prayer and Christian meditation, the awakening of meditation in Christianity, was something brand new that just popped up in the mid-70s when these movements suddenly emerged. And many people actually have some difficulty with that, that there are those uh, in both the Catholic and Protestant tradition that weren't exposed to this kind of teaching and practice when they were children. Uh, and so they often think that it was just brought in from somewhere else. Uh, and uh, I once read an article that said, well, they got the centering prayer from, from Buddhism or Hinduism or one of those other New Age religions, which I chuckled a bit. But I think some of the work that you've done so well with contemplative outreach over the 30 or 40 years that you've really been teaching is to, is to show people that, that centering prayer and the reawakening of meditation practice in, in Christianity is not something brand new, that it is deep in the bedrock of Christianity. And you've reintroduced people to those early centuries of the church and the great teachers uh, from the Desert Fathers and Mothers, St. Anthony, uh, Julian of Norwich, the Cloud of Unknowing, John of the Cross, all these wonderful people that are our Christian lineage that make contemplative prayer and deep meditative silence an authentic part of Christian experience. But I'd like to talk with you a little bit, ask you some questions uh, as an active participant uh, about an era that many of us don't know much about. And that's the era that immediately preceded the emergence uh, of centering prayer and uh, Christian meditation that, that sort of laid the groundwork for the recovery of a whole new Christian contemplative awakening. I'd like to talk with you a little bit about what it was like in the 50s and 60s and some of the movements that immediately set the stage for the awakening of this movement which such, with such force in the mid-70s. So first of all, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about the 1950s. Uh, that doesn't seem to me to be a really contemplative error in the life of the church. Uh, what was it like? What was it like for the Trappists and for Catholicism back in that era? Well, I was in just one monastery and it was, it was noted as the order is for solitude and not being engaged in outside activities. So what prompted us to, what was happening in the church at large was this uh, sudden inflow of uh, vocations of, of uh, young men, relatively young at least, who had been in the war or who had been educated since and and who had uh, become intrigued or fascinated with the, with the monastic life. When I entered, there were just three monasteries in this country, and, and it soon went up to 12 in the course of 10 or 12 years. Wow. So uh, I entered when there were about 80 monks at uh, Valley Falls, Rhode Island a monastery that burnt down almost completely in 1950. So at the very moment that you're talking about, the beginning of the 50s, uh, we, were, we were orphans without a monastery. And in the middle of the night, we were out in, uh, out in the snowbank, wondering where we were going to sleep. And uh, the monastery was, it was impossible to redo it. So uh, in the course of a few weeks, uh, the governor of Rhode Island was so gracious as to offer us an abandoned CCC camp. Oh, wow. With uh, uh, 
what shall I say, floors that were kind of wavering, that hadn't seen heat in a long time, and there was nothing but a wood stove that didn't last all night. And it was right by a lake, so that in the course of the uh, year that the community uh, had to stay there as refugees, about 12 of us, uh, not I, but 12 of us, got um, TB. Jeez. And had to spend uh, months or years in various hospitals. Well, what do you think was driving that great influx of vocations? Was it just having faced God in the war, or was there some... For some people, it was yeah. facing God in the war. Uh, was the I Catholic really don't know. I was not living in the world. Yeah. All I know is when I was out there, uh, no one seemed to have much interest in contemplative prayer. I couldn't really find uh, a priest who knew anything about it or most of them hadn't even heard of, of, a, of, of a contemplatively orientated monastery. So uh, what I did was fairly uh, unusual for somebody at that time, and uh, uh, I entered at the age of, of 20. And uh, a monastery that was uh, somewhat suffering from the uh, deprivations of the war in regard to heat and vehicles and transportation and uh, all those things. So it was a shock to me to see all these people coming in when when I was out there uh, nobody is, a uh, few people had even heard of it. Wow. It was a tradition that was uh, was lost and one of my motives for entering was to, to hopefully contribute something to recover it. Because in the two or three years, I guess three years that I had to wait because I was underage, you had to be 21, uh, if you, and my parents were heartily opposed to the, didn't give consent. So here I was uh, reading uh, the mystics as I began to hear of them, and they usually spoke about each other in spiritual books. So I was a student at Yale part of that time for two years, uh, during which time I spent much more of time uh, studying the, the mystics and the history of the Catholic Church that I felt was crucial to my survival. And uh, then I found the monastery and then uh, they agreed to accept me. So, so at, at that point, you'd need to know that the Trappists were still heavily invested in the Trappist tradition, which was only a reform of the, about the time of the French Revolution, and which was somewhat affected by uh, a heresy, uh, which was, uh, which was uh, called at the time Jansenism, but it had a very negative view of human nature and a dark view of human potentialities mm -hmm. and uh, very strict rules and basically a penitential life from start to finish. It was said that of those who entered, uh, most of them didn't live in the monastery more than eight or ten years. In other words, the life got to them. Well, over the centuries, the, uh, with the interference of, of some of the Roman people, uh, it, some of that was, was mitigated, but uh, it was extreme uh, asceticism and, and a, a view of the Christian life that was uh, heavily negative with very little emphasis on those values that we call the resurrection. And the, uh, while they emphasize confidence in God, you are constantly examining your conscience for small faults as though you were good for nothing. So, so uh, added to that was a very strict silence that discouraged friendship and that discouraged, uh, in fact, you couldn't 
speak to others without permission of the abbot, so that basically there were only two people you could speak to easily, or, and these were the novice master in charge of you and the abbot himself, both of whom could send you away at any time, so there was a tendency to hesitate on what you told them. <laughs> in any case, this very strict life disappeared in a few hours when the monastery on, uh, I guess it was March 19th, the Feast of St. Joseph, just burnt up. And, and there we were literally left out on the street with no place to go. And wow. So it was very trying for the abbot wow. and the community. And uh, fortunately, nobody was injured or or killed, although coming down the stairs, I swallowed some smoke that I think uh, caused me some lung problems later on in life. But, but anyway, the, uh, this surge of vocations came as a complete surprise to the superiors of the order and our local. And they felt they should provide for these young people. And so at, at all the monasteries, the three that existed at that time, they started receiving candidates. Well, briefly, I would say we were totally unprepared to handle and train that many people at once. For instance, in Gethsemane, they sometimes had 80 or 90 novices. Wow. With one novice master. and. Uh, so the harder it got, the more they loved it. Well, uh, some of do, not everybody. Yeah. But the young people coming in uh, submitted to this regime of, of total separation from the world. You could not go home, visit the family, even in a, a case of death. And you didn't go out for studies, and there was, the ministry was reserved just to uh, uh, providing for guests at the retreat house. So it was a life that was very concentrated on personal improvement or perfection, as they called it in those days, and uh, good for introverted people. So what was the exposure there to what we would now know contemplative practice? Where did you get your real immersion in contemplative prayer in that kind of environment? I think it uh, came to me before I entered by my own reading and, and uh, zeal to find out what this was. And I felt a great attraction to uh, give my life for it because I, I, I was doing some work with uh, teaching catechism in Lower Harlem at the time that I moved from uh, Yale to Fordham. My class uh, accelerated and I had another engagement in the summer. So, so I, I wanted so much to help those people. And yet I knew that I didn't have the inner resources to sustain the kind of generosity that they really needed to, you know, to, to, to be converted to the Christian way of life, let us say. Although they were basically Christians, they were baptized, but they really didn't know a thing about the, most of them, the church or the Bible. And so you felt that because of these conditions, these what you might call extreme conditions of, of, of silence and penitential practice, that that, con that created the only environment in which your own contemplative prayer could practice. Well, that was the impression you'd get from reading the uh, fathers of the mothers of the desert. Mm -hmm. And all, all of them insisted very much on this total self-denial, which, after all, uh, Christ himself presents to us in words that are per fairly clear. If you want to be my disciple, you have to deny yourself and come follow me, a following that would take us to the cross and death and hopefully resurrection. Yep. But, but under the terms of the day, as you experienced it in the, in the 50s and then as the 40s and as all these people, it seemed that the way that, that you were actually going to follow that, that way was by entering this very, very, uh, what you might call strict and rigid uh, Well, that format. was the, definitely the impression that was given by the spiritual books at that time, that you could only do contemplative prayer in a contemplative 
monastery. Well, yeah. I found out over the years that very few of them knew what that was. <laughs> yeah. It was, in other words, a, a marvelous tradition that was lost, and I think we had it in a significant manner. It was available in the monastery of Valley Falls and uh, some very uh, generous people there. But I don't think they had a clear idea of the transformative process that wow. uh, in recent years has become more prominent in, in all of the discussions of religious disciplines. Right, so they could throw you into the ambience. But I, I know you've spoken in some of your teaching about that even in the monasteries, that the gift of contemplation was in a way a sort of rare and remote gift that people yes, weren't claiming. Yes, it was very, it was thought to be very special, something reserved to saints or very ascetical people. So if you had to ask for it, it proved that you weren't ready for it because you were so proud that you thought you were worthy of it. Well, the mistake was a, a lack of distinctions and most good distinctions, especially in the spiritual plane that are rather subtle, really require discussion among people who know what they're talking about, uh, who can help you. Otherwise, you make superficial judgments that are really not accurate at all. But uh, the basics of the life were there. The office was uh, very long, six or, six or eight hours a day. And the uh, silence was very strict. Mm -hmm. And the uh, regime was very frugal and simple. And it was a simple life. And I frankly found those first years of silence as a, as a marvelous experience, though it was stretching, to, to deepen the concentration on what uh, following Christ or communion with Christ or experiencing the presence of Christ or becoming one with Christ really meant. And uh, in that process, one begins to see the almost unlimited number of faults and, or obstacles that you put to this kind of transforming process. So it, it's not an, an, uh, a project of inflation but it, it, uh, it gets into the, uh, first of all, what John of the Cross calls the night of sense, which is the realization that all the pleasures of the world are not going to bring permanent happiness. They're designed to provide help along the journey that's temporary, but not the happiness or the total transformation of the self that that uh, Jesus proposes and the great mystics uh, talk about. So I knew that the, the tradition was there and that many groups had followed it. I don't know how much it was uh, practiced by the average lay person, and yeah. especially in rural Christianity that was fairly deprived of the uh, preaching and education and things like that during the Middle Ages. Well, of course, what you said there just early on about the concentration being afforded in that atmosphere of silence with few distractions to pull you out must have been a wonderful gift for laying the groundwork for the, for the gift. I think so. I think that's its purpose. I think that's why it's so highly recommended by, by all the mystics, a discipline of mind and body and spirit that, that reduces the obstacles in us. It's not so much a question of getting something as getting rid of most of what you've got, which are plans for happiness that can't possibly work based on the instinctual needs of human nature, all of which are pretty well inherited from the mammals. So, so the spiritual life implies a theology and a cosmology that's coherent with the great teachings of the gospel about the availability of the kingdom, its closeness, the purpose of God in loving us so much he wants to introduce us into the greatest possible share in the divine life. That he sent his son uh, uh, to, who renounced his, his divine prerogatives in order to take the lowest place in humanity as a slave, according to St. Paul's teaching. And, and so 
there's no doubt in the gospel if it's read without preconceived ideas that God's will is to transform us insofar as possible, or humanly possible, into himself and to share with us uh, the infinite happiness that uh, belongs to him. And not only that, but to contribute once our own hearts are somewhat purified to the redemption of everyone else. So, so it's never a private journey. It's always uh, you're one of the whole and that we see ourselves more and more as just uh, equal to others, if not beneath them. And, and we don't uh, have any inclination to dominate or, or for uh, things like fame or, or uh, honor or being loved by everybody or never criticized, all the things that bother us in everyday life are really for the birds, but they sure bother us yeah. unless we face them head on. And those early church uh, teachers uh, were thoroughly aware of this because they faced persecution to the point of, of, of martyrdom uh, for several centuries. But even those in the desert experienced the, the weakness of human nature that Christ experienced in his, uh, you know, trip to the desert for 40 days and experiencing human nature in the raw, uh, where there was, he was told that Satan would make the, the stones into bread. And so the classical temptations of the spiritual life are pretty well uh, pointed out and experienced by Christ himself. So. So we're dealing with an extremely intimate process in which all of our efforts appear unequal to the task of being transformed, and yet all our aspirations or inmost desires are for this permanent kind of happiness and fulfillment that is not available, apparently, in this world. Now, contemplation is the means or the shortest access, if by contemplation you understand the, the growth of faith and hope and love to open our intuitive faculties to the presence of God and our unitive potentialities to the divine action. In other words, the this, this stages of relating to God that are both personal but profoundly enhancing of all the human potentials. And, uh, and that's what it seems to me monastic life is really about. I wasn't sure that I was finding it that clearly expressed in the monasteries of our time because the order as a whole was under the influence, and some of its books of instructions were under the influence of this earlier, slightly Jansenistic tradition in which human nature was essentially hopeless. And so the, the juxtaposition between the feeling of one's own weakness and the longing to be united to the perfect holiness and purity of God is going on at the same time in someone who is, uh, is following Christ and who is awakened to the, the possibilities that the divine life and the invitation of Christ is, is offering. And really they're so staggering and so overwhelming and so immense that uh, you wonder how people can miss it. Well, of course, right there is the, the rub, because you're, you're speaking, and you're speaking so beautifully of the gift that you, in a particular way, and the organization you've, you've brought to all of us has helped to say. We can say that nowadays. Uh, when I was growing up in the, in the 50s, back in the time when you were in this rigid, silent, but growing monastery being thrown into the, to the fires of the contemplative transformation, I was out there in my schoolgirl years wearing my poodle skirt, uh, learning Elvis Presley songs, 
We were aware in town that there were two kinds of kids. There was the Protestant kids, which we were, and there were the Catholic kids. And some of the Catholic kids would go and then dis disappear into monasteries. But there was no access whatsoever to any of these teachings, this, this contemplation. The, my, my parents, being good Protestants, were terrified of what went on behind the closed Catholic doors. Uh, what little I knew of contemplation, and I actually knew a lot by a very great gift, that I'd been raised in the Quaker tradition, where they keep that living and simple immersion in, in living silence. But there was no, it seemed like a divide there in the 50s, like so much did, between those that had access to these deeper religious waters and nothing out there for the rest of us. Contemplation, we'd never heard the word. Well, and, I'd just like to say, I don't think it was behind those clo closed doors either. Yeah. But for a sense, it was almost completely lost for all practical purposes. Well, there's the irony of it, isn't it? That, that, yes. that, that there it was. So uh, I've been thinking a lot about, you know, under the surface that that era seems so monolithic. The Catholic Church itself, uh, under Pius, Pope Pius, was building schools and institutions. It, it seemed to be a very, very stable time in the 50s. But, but there was already stuff percolating under the surface. And I, I think myself that there were three major things that I'd love to talk about that really began to break up that environment. Uh, and the first that, that comes to me is a, as a hungry young seeker looking for sources for something I didn't even know was missing in the 50s. Uh, was when Thomas Merton fell into my hands. And like, like many, many people, I gulped down the seven-story mountain in great drafts of seeing myself. And his little book on contemplative prayer, I think, is probably one of the most important and watershed writings, beginning to open up what you might call the, the universal call to contemplation and this unthinkable idea that not just cloistered contemplatives at the end of their lives, if they were lucky, but every human being by virtue of their birth and baptism was offered the gift of contemplation. And so Merton was one of your fellow Trappists, Father Louis there. I wondered if you could talk a little bit about, about him and what you see as his influence, and if you knew him personally? I met him a few times, but uh -huh. I didn't know him personally. Uh -huh. And he was already a controversial figure. Within the Trappists? Yes. Uh huh. And I don't think uh, too well received by his own community. But eventually, his <laughs> superiors certainly recognized his genius, but he was a pretty big genius to fit into a monastery even as big as Gethsemane. Eventually, became the novice master, I think, in the early 50s. And he, he is turning out to be, in the course of time, certainly one of the great uh, spiritual writers and lecturers of of the ninth of the twentieth century, and and certainly a forerunner in trying to recover the contemplative dimension, both its history and practice. Uh, that was the first thing I think he did was to aim at trying to recover the contemplative tradition, and you find that reflected in the uh, seven-story mountain and in the uh, contemplative life that. Uh, uh, was actually uh, inspired by Father Basil Pennington, a monk of Spencer, who was the editor of a publication. Oh, okay. And asked him if he would write something on the contemplative life. But along with that, Mo, uh, Merton grew fast because of his genius, his capacity for uh, communication. He uh, got interested in the social issues of, of, of the 60s. 
And the early interspiritual issues too. For him. And uh, then, he, then he got interested in interspiritual uh, way ahead of his time. And, <clears throat> and so those three areas he pioneered in, in the Catholic transition from a very uh, a narrow perspective of, of possibilities to a, a very, well, to an, a universe that actually exists, which has no end. Yeah. But he, he was very talented, and, uh, and uh, his books continue to be very well read. He was capable of writing with the greatest of ease. He'd write a whole book just from a few notes stuck to a bulletin board, I was told by his secretary. And, and, and he could write fast and without having to correct most of what he wrote, except here and there. So, so he was a superb teacher and a speaker, and uh, and I think uh, I I wasn't there, so I can't be sure. But he seemed to be a problem for the much of the community, especially the old timers, who thought of contemplative life as a lifestyle only, that is to say, where you're separated from the world and have silence and solitude in a big way. And so, how did he think of it? What? How did Merton think of it? Oh, he had, he knew perfectly well what it meant uh, from his studies and his own experience that it, 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 it's, it's an interior life. But it, it, it was a surprise to me to find that Many monks, especially the lay brothers, identified the contemplative life as going to choir, mm -hmm. which they didn't feel called to do as lay brothers who wanted to serve the work needs or the material labor that was necessary in the community. So this was a huge thing to get over, and I myself ran into it when I became a superior and tried to talk about contemplative prayer. Some people uh, wouldn't exactly get off get up and leave, but the, the expression on their face was clearly that, that they were elsewhere and they didn't want to hear about this. So the awakening of a universal transformed heart as the essence of contemplation was, was not something that people were thinking about not in those clear, days. Not yeah. known. Well, yeah. nobody had studied it and you never heard about it in the parish. Right, and so, so Merton named what had actually been there all along, but people had forgotten it was there. Yes. And it kind of had to make a journey outside of the monastery in order to come back into it. Well, it he made like. a tremendous contribution to recovering it. Actually, I had begun to, to be acquainted with it through my own research and my conversion from uh, my worldly ways at 17 uh -huh. as a freshman at Yale and uh, reading a lot of modern philosophers, I was challenged in my faith and, and almost gave it up. But then I started praying and reading uh, the mystics and uh, I was uh, pretty committed. And, but I didn't find any support or help anywhere in mm -hmm. my environment. Interesting. So it's an exoskeleton of contemplation rather than uh, really the, the inner heart of it. Did yeah. you read Merton at all? Did you read The Seventh Story? Well, as we heard, we read his Seven Story Mountain in the refectory. I read, uh, read his book, Ascent to Truth, which is just a summary of St. John of the Cross, and, but an excellent one. He often repeated some of the things said by the great mystics, but in up-to-date and, and clearer form and, and with his own uh, experience and, and wisdom. It, it was wonderful, and he could write he was something day and night without any effort. But it had effects on his health, and also I think he felt uh, somewhat rejected by some members of the community because they didn't know what to make of him. He was, he was just too big or yeah. too uh, uh, broad-minded for the mentality of that was still uh, pretty well soaked with Trappist traditional behaviors yeah. and expectations. Irish Catholic Jansenist mythic membership cultural Catholicism. Uh, well, its best expression, you might say, was yeah. in a monastery. 
Of course, the other orders were were responding to the need for buildings and teaching and yeah. various uh, external ministries. So I had no time to think of yeah. contemplation as such, nor no instruction. And the novitiates didn't provide any training or practices apart from external observance. And, and this was one of the main insights that prompted me to think of centering prayer as a practice, which was not centering prayer because it's just a word for what I considered to be the traditional approach of the mystics and contemplatives of the Christian tradition. It was perfectly clear to me by that time. But uh, most people thought of the path to contemplation as contained entirely in the rule of St. Benedict with an external observance of a great deal of liturgical prayer in common, uh, frugal life, uh, intense solitude, and intense silence, and complete obedience to the abbot. A blind obedience, preferably, without any question. And that's true as a, as a good ascetical practice for a time. If, one is a little wedded to one's own thoughts, but it, it, I saw that the, the, the rule of alone is not the contemplative life and isn't necessarily going to lead to it unless there is a more intimate practice that brings us into confrontation with our interior faults and our mixed motivation in which our, even our good deeds are pretty well saturated in the beginning with uh, egoic motivations, such as to be praised or to be seen or to uh, uh, teach others or uh, before we have learned anything ourselves and so on. Well, I wanted to comment on this other thing, and I know it's a, it's a very, very delicate piece of the puzzle and it's a really important piece, but another thing that happened right at the end of the 1950s and is almost a, a watershed, I think, for the cultural history of humankind, is that China invaded Tibet and the Buddhist culture was displaced. And it seems that this began a great movement of, uh, that, that started sort of toward the end of the 50s and then really got rolling through the 60s of, of Eastern teachers coming west and Western teachers coming east, and a great, uh, great what you might call spiritual transfusion, and and I know that centering prayer came into being right in the midst of this, and that you were deeply uh, involved in some of that at, at at Spencer, and I wondered if you could talk a little bit about that. What was it, and how did you work inter spiritually to to bring? Uh, bring centering prayer to birth and also how can you how can you then sort of reassure people that that you're not just borrowing from TM as people sometimes say but have really worked together to receive wider influences within a particularly Christian milieu so so tell us a little bit yes. about how it came to be there <laughs> yes uh, no it happened and uh, as you say uh, the spirit seems to have moved uh, uh, negative uh, events of a historical character into a great diaspora, somewhat like the Hebrew diaspora. It is, wasn't so it? That it, yeah. it? It got out of the locked gates of Tibet, perhaps by the only way it could get out, by being thrown out or escaping. And it's terribly sad but it's been an enormous benefit in making the Tibetan wisdom, which is certainly one of, if not the most uh, uh, sublime of the uh, Buddhist traditions available almost everywhere on earth. And, and it's still spreading. And, uh, and it's certainly, along with all the Hindu teachers who were excellent and mm -hmm. some Jains and uh, some Sufis, they all started coming to this country after the war. Uh, Vivekananda, at his appearance at the 
World Parliament of Religions uh, in this country in the eight, I think the 1890s or something, right, yeah. uh, made a great impression on people. And that whole tradition until then was almost unknown here in the West. That's the Vedanta tradition, right? Yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. And so uh, we, these people were all arriving here saying, here is, here is our method to attain divine union or non-dual consciousness. Where is yours? And there was no answer. <laughs> oh. And in fact, people were insulted. They came over here, some uh, especially naive and loyal followers, as if uh, uh, that was loyalty. It isn't. Uh, the openness to the truth did not exist at that time, and so everybody was was uh, afraid of it, including me. <laughs> really? <laughs> oh, sure. I, I was afraid it would. Uh, attract people, and especially young people, and it did. And I saw that it was helping them. And so I didn't know how to explain this, because uh, the, I still had that unconscious conviction that the, the Catholic dogmatic and doctrinal teaching was, was the only one there is. Not just the best, but the only one that really was acceptable to God, and I didn't know where these people were coming from or where they got their wisdom. But with Father Merton's help, she started writing, and I started finding out about 1970. I would have found out earlier, except that I, uh, there were a lot of problems in our monastery to resolve as people tried on the experiments that were committed by Vatican II. So it was a time when our life changed uh, more in, in, in five years than in 1,500. I, wow, wow. And we'll come back to that in a minute. Not but. everybody was happy with that, and, and so uh, everybody blamed the abbots in those days. So they were the least popular people in the monastery in the, in the 60s. But in the 50s, they, they were still uh, very authoritative and very hierarchical, as you can read in the Rule of St. Benedict. So as you began seeing from inside and outside during this period that, that, that Christianity and monasticism had, had lost the inner experience of contemplation, and it was kind of solidified in these external forms and observances, and you began to see that some of these, uh, these Eastern teachings and the effect they were having on the young people was opening up the inner experience. Exactly. I was saying, there, uh, all the youngsters who, who uh, we were in a fairly uh, place where many of these traditions were represented near mm -hmm. Boston and New England, and they would come to check us out sometimes, and they didn't even know there were, there existed a Christian spirituality. They thought it was all moralistic and ritualistic, and they didn't feel any attraction to that. But uh, they were fascinated by the buildings itself, but uh, along with their uh, uh, development of an unwillingness to make a commitment of any length, they, uh, they, didn't, they were finding in their Buddhist meditation uh, not only challenges, but great rewards yeah. uh, uh, by the reduction of their, which we know now through neuroscience of, uh, science of their uh, distorted brain <laughs> wiring from their early childhood that had to be corrected before they could really be quiet. So uh, I felt a wound, you know, in my heart that the tradition I know that we've tried to live at this monastery in Valley Falls was very demanding, very solid, and very beautiful but required a lot of prayer. I used to spend almost all the free time in uh, prayer. They called it adoration in those days before the Blessed Sacrament in the Church. It hardly occurred to me that Christ was in me all the time anyway. Yeah. But that was the 
emphasis that the uh, abbot at the time gave, he had great devotion to the Blessed Sacrament. So the lay people then, what you began to find by being directly introduced to meditation, that work of transforming the brain was perhaps happening every bit as effectively with far less external structure around it than for than in the in the contemplative life. Well, that it was working for them at all. Yeah, it was right. a surprise. I mean, yeah. why is why is Christ giving them these gifts? Because they seem to be genuine. <laughs> Yeah. When here we are working hard Struggling night and day away. and getting yeah. nowhere. That was yeah. a, that was that was a thought. <laughs> wow. Feeling. So, so I wanted to say, and I said to the community in uh, 1975, isn't there some way we could, we could put the Christian tradition into some kind of a method that would make the observances practical and help to interiorize them so that people would have a clear idea of what these observances are for, which they didn't. So when there was a chance to change them, they did, a lot of them. So how did you find help? I I remember that you had some real participation with, uh, there was a Buddhist Roshi that worked with you in those days, weren't there, and and also some people in in the Transcendental Meditation Method. Yes, we saw the, yes. but this was largely because people were pushing me. I didn't go looking for them, yeah. but they, uh, the Roshi arrived one day with uh, Professor Uno of the University of Massachusetts. No kidding. Just, uh, who just passed away. Uh-huh. And he, the uh, Roshi, didn't speak English, so he had to have a translator. And so he was on his way to Europe to see what the Trappists do, because he had uh, so many disciples who wanted, to, who who he wanted to impose the Buddhist uh, rituals on, that he didn't know whether they'd accept it. So he wondered what uh, Christian mon- monks might do. So he wanted to see a monastery, and he <laughs> offered to come and give lectures. Wow! And I said, "Well, what would you talk about?" And <laughs> He would talk about Jesus Christ and him crucified and resurrected. So I couldn't object to that. And uh, so I heard him, and his tape shows were uh, fascinating, And uh, even though they were translated. And uh, he then, uh, we then engaged him to come back, and uh, with great ecumenical spirit, he even put on this habit. He uh, did he, okay. when he did it in the monastery, and then after that, some were uncomfortable and preferred that he uh, do the retreats uh, at a retreat house uh, just off the property. So, so for ten years, that great man came uh, twice a year and gave us a, a sashin of about a week, wow. and a certain number in the community were interested, but. But uh, definitely few in the proportion to the size of the community, and uh, one of them has since become a roshi himself, and but stayed in the monastery. So he's a he's a Zen man, man, uh, roshi in a Christian monastery. Wow, Cistercian monastery. Well, of course, I heard about this when you introduced me to your dear friend and who had been a monk there, Joseph Chukang. Uh, yeah. And Joseph, who was a Vietnamese-born Christian monk, never exposed to Buddhism, first sat under the Roshi, and all of a sudden he got that that Jesus' teaching had a transformational inside. And, And his wonderful book on contemplative experience is so deeply and luminously informed of it. Yes, now he was a a thorough, uh, well-developed contemplative, Mm-hmm. And so he had a, or a predisposition to understand the teaching in a way that our Westerners were completely floored by, because as you know in Zen, it starts where reason leaves off. Yeah. And so uh, the struggling with koans is what the Roshi Sasaki recommended. Right, and that's then, and when Joseph saw that Jesus was actually giving people koans in his practice, it just transformed his life. I, I remember meeting that man just radiant yes. with the inner and the outer having met in him. Yes. Well, it was becoming clear then in the early 70s that there was a, a, a lot going yeah. and that the young people 
were not coming to us for this training, but didn't think we had it in the first place. And then uh, even if they decided we were looking for the same thing, they didn't want to make those particular sacrifices, especially celibacy. Mm -hmm. So they, uh, they moved on. And uh, I could see that they were having mystical experiences. And, and, uh, and I began to appreciate that. And that's the, the time, especially Merton's insight into Zen and into Sufis. That's right, he was doing that too. Were helpful. So he's also a pioneer, not just in renewing the Christian contemplative tradition, but in introducing the importance of dialogue between spiritual teachers so that they might help each other or expand each other's uh, spiritual experience. And that happened uh, because circumstances like travel, geography, and the, the technology made it possible for the East and West to start mingling cultures. Well, of course, it's got a long way to go, but it's nonetheless... It got launched. Uh, ...has come an enormous distance in my short lifetime. Talk to me a little bit about TM and how the people in Transcendental Meditation were involved in the launch of, of Centering Prayer. I know a lot of people will say, oh, Centering Prayer, it's just, it's just TM in disguise. But what is the story there? How did you meet these, the, the TM folks? Well, once again, they yeah. <laughs> came to see us. And uh, a couple of them were, uh, were former novices. Uh-huh. Really? Like... Uh, 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 Elias oh, okay. of uh, Georgia. Oh, yes. He, he, uh, That's right. I'd forgotten that part of the story. I went actually to uh, the university for, uh, in uh, Fairfield, Iowa, at his request, and spoke to their students at the Maharishi University. Uh -huh. And they were so excited. I remember when I said Mass there, I invited them, as was customary, to come around the altar. Well, they almost climbed on it. They climbed all over me. I was sort of inundated by these devout youngsters looking for whatever was hidden in the Eucharist. But anyway, uh, uh, actually, some of the brethren found Buddhism too hard, mm -hmm. too demanding for them. But they wanted something else, and TM seemed to be a little more accessible. And it was, uh, it was not as demanding as then, although you could take uh, advanced courses. And, but you could start out with just 20 minutes uh, twice a day, which is pretty much the minimum that most of the uh, mystical traditions say you have to start with to get anywhere. In, in, uh, in approaching the divine indwelling through the mystery and, and the reality of interior silence. So uh, they offered to come and teach us, and, and I offered it to the community if they wanted to do it, and, and uh, we paid something for that. So they came and did it, and about 50 or 60 people took it. I was amazed. At wow. But once a number take it, they all sort of wanted to try it, you might say, unless they were fairly strong in their negative convictions. So what they did with it after that was up to them. We didn't try to have a particular period where you do only this. And it, 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 it was uh, the experience of, of TM uh, that was very successful with lay people and people in all the professions and businesses that I thought, uh, well, it could help us in the monastery to get at least a taste for the contemplative spirit that we're trying to manifest in our lifestyle. Wow. Which I didn't think we were succeeding too well, especially in that area, area where the silence had been greatly modified and so people were talking about everything that they didn't use to do so the there was more noise uh, more conflict in the community mm -hmm. 
and they needed something to quiet them down. So I was. I, so this this helped. What what's the difference in your take between them? Between what? Between TM and centering prayer. Uh, well, I, I I really don't. Uh, 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 see it as, 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 as some, uh, or I do see it from different perspectives. Okay. First of all, uh, everybody has this dimension of interior silence, and there are many ways of discovering it. And, uh, and so I presented the one that I had experienced from my Christian tradition. Yeah. And, uh, but it's so simple that anybody who's doing this, who doesn't already have a contemplative practice, uh, sort of spontaneously arising in them, needs something and will benefit from this process if they keep doing it. And, uh, and to have enough sense to extend it as time goes on, uh, so, as far as time goes, uh, the problem with Zen was, although I, I don't say this in criticism of them, that their emphasis on the moral behavior was was somewhat weak, mm -hmm. so that you could have some of these experiences and still, at least from the Christian or Catholic point of view, be somewhat seriously lacking in the moral behavior, especially mm -hmm. in sexuality. Yeah. So. They, I've met so many wonderful young people at, at Maharishi Yastiva, and we did a videotape uh, mm -hmm. with question and answers, and they were extremely respectful, and most of them, I think, were Christians, yeah. and who hadn't found anything in their own tradition. And so I came along as a kind of surprise, and they were delighted to have someone from their own tradition who was speaking congenially and sympathetically with the TM method. Wow. But not only our monastery, but also uh, the monastery in Georgia had quite a bit of uh, interaction with uh, Maharishi, and I think his wisdom was excellent. Sounds like he brought sort of a clear vase in which you could capture the deep water of whatever tradition you were in. Well, the big thing it seems to me that they did, and their, he and their teachers, was, was, to, was to prove that you don't have to wait to be a great ascetic or a great uh, anything to, to, to pray in this way. In, in other words, the contemplative prayer is not just for special people, but for it belongs to human nature. And that, I think, I greatly admired his contribution because it was so widespread. He was very well known, and people before had never even heard of meditation. Right. Well, that's where it came full circle for me, because, of course, when I grew up in the Quaker tradition, that was what was always taught. There is that of God in every person, and it's most deeply uh, accessed and encountered by the silence. Yes. As well, what Maharishi did was make it popular. Yeah. So that people who were opposed to religion yes. would could still do it. It's on the map then, yeah. And uh, he had lots of other developments, and some of which I think might have been a little uh, prudent for this country, like the uh, like uh, levitating and uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, I don't say it's, it's impossible, but I, I don't think it was a helpful yeah. ad adjunct to his teaching, which was quite uh, simple and pure. Because, and for him, you didn't desire it for its own sake. It just this just was one of the things that were available that could help you uh, uh, establish your practice. But so, so some of his students were really quite advanced in the contemplative process. So once again, it was clear that it was not your religion that made this possible, but your humanity. Wow. And that everybody was called to it, and for lack of it, they would, would seek happiness in the wrong places, and that eventually destroys society, as it is doing at this moment. Yeah, that's a beautiful line. It's not your religion that calls you to it, but your humanity. 
Yeah. I love that. That's a, that's a keeper. And it's amazing what I'm hearing in this story, and a lot of this is wonderful. It's sort of priceless, new new revelations of this 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 really really wonderful womb in which all of a sudden these practices emerged. But I'm hearing you didn't go out looking for them. That with a kind of synchronicity that you had the post of Abbott and these things came to you. Yes. And you were receptive. Yes, I could have rejected them as many monasteries did. Right. But it was almost as if some higher purpose, if you want to say that, was moving through it to allow it to be born through this receptivity and synchronicity and alertness to what was the invitation. Well, be that as it may, uh, I certainly saw that uh, that there was great interest in this because not just uh, I thought maybe a few bedraggled priests and nuns might be interested and mm -hmm. that if we taught them they could share it with others. Mm -hmm. I didn't have this huge universal vision that this when you go uh, to a lot of people. So when uh, not only uh, uh, the male retreatants at the retreat house showed interest. Uh, then the Protestants showed just as much interest. And oh, then, yeah. And uh, few priests were interested, but they usually had hesitations, I think, because of their theological presuppositions yeah. and mindsets. And, and so I could see it was not going to reach everybody, but it, re it was of interest to the major superiors of men in this country, and uh, Father Basil, one of our co-members of this uh, effort to create a, a means of, of uh, giving people the experience of, of uh, interior prayer. So centering prayer is a term that we didn't choose ourselves. It was suggested by someone was it Armand Prue who came up with the name? I think so. I think so. He was the, he was a provincial when you knew him. Yes, and he had, he was not wedded to it, but they had to think of something. People were worried about the prayer of the cloud, as it was called, from the cloud of unknowing. It, yes, that it, might not appeal. Not not much of a but spin to it. Centering prayers had trouble because centering can be used in many it has, yeah. terms, but uh, actually it's used by Saint John of the Cross as the path to our most interior self, the true self and beyond that, which is the divine light within everybody that the human, uh, Hindus call the spark of divinity. Yeah, it's kind of interesting because I know that that, that, that word centering prayer has been a red flag to some who think it means that we're going to go inside and find God living in a box inside our ego. I, I have a one friend who was a uh, a fundamentalist Christian who uh, successfully implanted Centering Prayer at his church when he was able to rename it, and he called it Abiding Prayer, as in abide in me as I in you. Well, there's a translation of the yeah. basic book called uh, not Centering Prayer, but the prayer in, in secret, I guess. It's yeah, yeah. A prayer of silence. So it, you can call it anything you like. Yeah with the understanding that in the deep depths of the surrendered heart, uh, one, one encounters the holy and loving God. Yes. And it's one not about the ego writ large. Or yes, <laughs> so it presupposes a theology in which you believe in a higher power that mm -hmm. resides within you, perhaps as your source, but at least as present here and now, at a level that is not undo influenced by the senses. So it, it, it's not destroyed by the senses either. And it's what lives forever. And it doesn't die. It can't die. It's the image and likeness of God, to use the Hebrew right. terminology in Genesis. So, so this is the great problem uh, uh, that is the obstacle to contemplative prayer being recognized as, as everybody's uh, natural happy time. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Capacity. And, uh, and power that keeps growing into more and more uh, meaning and freedom and joy and compassion and service of others. In other words, all the genuine virtues, both personal and social, are, 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 are condensed, so to speak, 
uh, somewhat like all the energies of the universe were condensed in the Big Bang. And so each of us has its own Big Bang yeah. that will never end, that it's already started, but we can thwart it by ignoring it or by uh, opposing it. So some people oppose it for reasons of, of their belief system, which uh, they're very sincere, but they're simply uninformed of both of the tradition and now of the fact that other spiritual traditions, older than ours as Christians, like the Hindus, the Buddhists, the Jain, have methods of, of, of prayer that are very similar to this. Because there isn't anything, any difference when you get to that degree of silence. Yeah. Uh, God is God, and uh, whoever uh, is dealing with him is one, not only with him, but everybody else. So the, the new inter-spiritual dialogue, which is something beyond inter-religious dialogue, in other words, it, it starts with inter-religious dialogue, but as friendship deepens and people share their own experience, it begins to talk about the spiritual practices in one's tradition that helped us to reach whatever level of freedom and, and uh, humility and love and service that we've got. Yeah. And that that is open to further development of which uh, contemplative prayer is... Uh, perhaps could be called just the beginning. A universal, yeah. But it's an enormous, the enormous differences between the perspective of rational consciousness and the intuitive or unitive experience of centering prayer. And without the latter, people don't see the real meaning of scripture or of doctrine or of... Uh, uh, events in everyday life. And exactly. A nod to Ken Wilber and his line level fallacy that as we, that this, this deep intuitive unit of wisdom belongs at a level in all traditions. And that as you begin to ac access them, uh, you're actually closer to people of different traditions who have reached this level of, of transformation than to those in your same religious line that are working in a much more exoteric way. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's it seems that, yeah. that uh, a, a spirit is working in our time through the dialogue, into spiritual dialogues and the teaching of genuine wisdom teachers that awakens people uh, to a dimension of their relationship that they had never experienced before. A sense of oneness, a sense of respect and honor for something deeper than their personality difficulties or their uh, whether they like us or not. In other words, there's something of great uh, respect, honor, and uh, even magnitude that makes them uh, or requires the honor of every other person so that the uh, the issues of equal, uh, of equality and competition uh, uh, affirm them, uh, uh, either affirm themselves or dissolve in the face of the truth of that everyone is coming from the same source and is destined to become more and more one with everything that is, and that, uh, that God is really in everything that is as its first cause, and perhaps is the uh, ultimate self. Today we think a lot about the different selves, the true self, false self, uh, ego self, and all, all these selves mm -hmm. <laughs> usually represent a certain level of perception. We see ourselves in the light of this experience that is largely a tissue of memories from early life and habits that have been formed in the brain mm -hmm. that are going to continue functioning unless you make an effort to change them, which is what asceticism has always tried to do. So there's a, there's a unifying principle going on and certain, to, to summarize, uh, Merton contributed greatly to three of the main things that are 
required of contemplatives. One is to renew their own tradition mm -hmm. and imbibe it and know what it is and live it. The other is to appreciate the importance of sharing it in the world in some way uh, through the uh, social issues and cares and especially love of the poor mm -hmm. and those most in need and also interspiritual dialogue which reduces once and for all the unfortunate competition and needless defense mechanisms of organizations that have uh, endangered the human species by their uh, naive loyalties and caused uh, enormous violence and that these must work together if the planet is going to survive. So, so now we have to include in social issues, of course, the, the earth, the ecology, the social situations and so on. And so the, the whole world is opening up because and more and more people are seeing the world and the world problems from the uh, position of uh, faith in the goodness of God and the, the capacity for God to bring good out of every situation. As the Buddha say, everything just as it is, is perfect. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, Thomas, I've, as I think of this, and we, we should probably be beginning to, to bring uh, this wonderful conversation to a close, but uh, I look at it and everything, everything happens in time. And you've been in this wonderful position to be positioned in, in life right at the point where this amazing change was going on to a sort of from a rigid and penitential and external understanding of contemplation and religions and isolation uh, to this new emergence with an understanding of an interior oneness that moves out to change the world. You've been in the, in the thick of it while that happened and you've actually uh, held the post for most of it, I think people would say that that you're certainly one of the top guys in the history who took the torch and carried it a step further and and brought brought what had been hidden and secret and dusty into a prominence and a support system so that hundreds of thousands of of human beings worldwide can begin to profit from it. And I'd simply, I'd simply ask you your question. I mean, what do you think it was in you that allowed you to keep reaching out and saying yes to that next step, even though it looks scary? You, you've often characterized yourself as starting out very, very, you know, rigid and by the books and uh, deeply wedded to your own intellectual Christian piety. What do you attribute it to in yourself that just tips him, nope, let the Roshi come, nope, let's take the next step. Where'd that come from in you? Well, <laughs> it uh, didn't come from me. Uh -huh. it, these are uh, the lights that I received, and uh, you'd have to ask God why he gave it to me. I would say that my chief uh, recommendation it's not anything I've done, but the fact that God chose me to do it. And, and if it succeeds, that's the only reason. Wow, that's great. Yeah, you, you seem to be exhibit A for the, for the proof that the path that you've lived your life staked on actually works. It, it does its transformative work if you, if you stick with it from both inside and outside. Well, that's a big subject. <laughs> I, I would say that I don't easily accept the judgments of, uh, of how uh, much I've contributed mm -hmm. because from my perspective, it's not nearly enough and it was full of mistakes and limitations and failures. So perhaps my chief claim to fame is my weakness. And I've heard that before in Christian theology. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, uh, I take very seriously Jesus' statement, mm -hmm. which is translated differently in many 
ways, but this one was even incorporated in the Catholic liturgy at one point, although it's no longer there. And it, Jesus was talking about disciples, he had, and he said, if you want to save your life, you will bring yourself to ruin. So I presume what he means there, your life, meaning the false self, and all these obstacles to the realization of the divine presence within us as, as loving and, and forgiving. So if you want to save your life, you will bring yourself to ruin. But anyone who brings himself or herself to nothing will find out who they are. Uh, that's a, a very profound William, uh, wisdom saying, and pretty much what I think the Advaitic Hindus and the Buddhists are saying too, although they, they, they don't emphasize uh, the personal aspect of this relationship because they didn't have it in their revelation, so they can't be expected. So my hope is that in the interreligious dialogue increases with honesty and, uh, and experience, more and more spiritual teachers will perceive that they are basically uh, saying and teaching the same experience of wisdom, which is the acceptance of of our nothingness, whether you attribute this to the fact that everything just has always existed, as some want to do, or if you accept it as the, uh, the fact that we uh, failed and can't do it ourselves. So nothingness really is who God is, meaning infinite possibilities. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's really the stepping stone to resurrection. Well, thank you, Thomas. I think you've, uh, you've sketched some pieces that for me had always just been hanging out there together. I think you've given us a real perspective on both the radical continuity and the radical innovation and daring uh, that, that brought about this wonderful contemplative reawakening and, and a wonderful testament to the fact that how we are able through our own practice to place ourselves in the way of saying yes to the flow by bringing ourselves to nothing really allows this wonderful dynamism of God's ongoing creative love to come into our lives and our hearts so thank you so much, and I've loved this time to, to sit, not exactly at your feet, but across from no, you. No, please and, don't do that. And to know, and to share this wonderful time together. No, it's sharing. Thank, thank you. you.